Today we're taking a look at some of the most brutal torture devices of all time to receive a painful lesson in human anatomy. You know what that means. That's right class. We're taking a field trip. What have I got myself into? Now, if you're very sensitive to the idea of corporal punishment, then you might want to consider watching one of my other videos about chiropractic manipulation or the creation of space marines. But if not, stick around as I get right to it. Learning about human anatomy is not always for the faint of heart. During the Middle Ages, the pillory was a wood or metal contraption used to detain criminals. And what crime have you committed? I danced on a Sunday. Wherein a wooden framework would clamp down around the neck and the wrists. Locking someone in place like this could easily cause numbness due to compression of the nerves or a lack of blood flow in any number of areas, arms, legs, hands, feet, depending on one's posture and weight distribution in the device. However, it was unlikely to do any lifelong damage as most pillory punishments lasted only a few hours. Whew. But within that time frame, however, as the muscle of the low back begins to tire, the prisoner could be forced to rely on their neck and wrists to bear the brunt of their weight. Tracheal bruising could easily be sustained as a result of gravity pulling it against the edge of the device. But physical torture in and of itself was only part of the equation, as so expertly explained on the Medieval Madness YouTube channel, who we will hear from a few times today. Public humiliation was a major part of both corporal and capital punishment during the Middle Ages. But of course, because what would a pillory be without a little slop? And you will behave accordingly. <laughs> People can be so cruel to one another. And unfortunately, with every torture method we'll cover in today's class, audience involvement was a key part to the success of the judgment because it only increased the victim's shame. Obviously, a device that locks a person helplessly in place, usually in a central location during the busiest times of the day, often subjected them to the uglier side of human nature. A rock thrown with enough force could easily break or knock out a tooth or fracture any number of facial bones, including the zygomaxillary complex, the orbital, or even the lacrimal bone. The most fragile of the 14 facial bones that resides at the front of the orbit near the corner of the eye closest to the nose, where it supports the eye. Or what about one of the 27 bones in the hand? so deftly exposed for cruel passers-by. There are even accounts of criminals who had their ears and noses cut or ripped off, then nailed to the pillory itself if their crime seemed to justify this action to the powers that be. Then we'll nail the ear to the front door of the house, we'll invite a bunch of people Why? to look at it, because that's what we want to do. While two nasal bones and extensions of the maxillae form the bridge of the nose, which is the bony portion, the remainder of the framework is cartilage, which is covered by connective tissue and skin, which offers minimal resistance to anything with even a modicum of sharpness. Likewise, the ears are made of tough cartilage covered by skin, which although very effective at funneling sound into the ear, stand no chance to a blade. Another similar mode of punishment deployed in the Middle Ages were the stocks. The stocks had boards placed around the ankles and wrists, meaning that the accused would need to be in a sitting position as the feet were restrained. I mean, at least these prisoners were able to remain seated throughout the duration of their punishment. Although the stocks were less painful, people could be left there for days or even weeks, with continued exposure sometimes leading to death. The longer criminals were detained in the stocks, dehydration and starvation became more and more concerning. Although you can go weeks without food, three days without water is generally thought to be the upper limit, as H2O is essential to our basic functions, such as perfusion of our vital organs, maintenance of our plasma or blood volume, maintenance of our intracellular turgor pressure, or the pressure maintaining the shape of our cells, or even the regulation of temperature through perspiration, to name but a few. I really can't decide which is worse. Some pillories, stocks, and whipping posts were often combined during the Middle Ages, so that they could hold several reprobates at the same time. As you can see, 
sinister combinations of this kind were all too common throughout history. One of these devices stood in the marketplace near to the town hall at Wallingford in Berkshire. It held four prisoners, two in the stocks, one at the whipping post and one in the pillory. The final addition to this sinister trifecta is of course the whipping post. Whether metal or bone pieces attached to the tip, plaited thongs or tips dipped in milk and then dried out in the sun. They were all meant to lacerate the skin and cause as much pain as possible. These devices could quite easily disfigure or kill the victim. Thanks again, MM. Unfortunately, whipping, flogging, and lashing have been common practice in many societies, and even more recently than we'd like to think. Depending on the crime, lashes administered number anywhere from the low single digits to the thousands although higher numbers would usually have been spread out over time. Job's not finished. Job finished? 100 or 120 lashes could result in death, as pieces of flesh would be ripped from the body and the victim would die from blood loss. With every lash delivered, the skin and muscle tissue, usually on the back, is lacerated, ripped, and torn. obviously causing severe pain and blood loss. One of the main functions of the skin, which is made up of three layers, the dermis, epidermis, and hypodermis, is to protect the body and internal organs from mechanical injury and infection. The dermis portion varies in thickness across your body. It's thinnest over your eyelids, where it's 0.6 millimeters thick, and it's thickest over your back, where it's approximately four millimeters thick, and more even in some places. But I mean, What's four millimeters to a bone-tipped whip? <laughs> Thank God our rib cage wraps around the body to protect the vital organs in our torso from behind. But this won't stop the bleeding and eventually hypovolemic shock, a condition in which severe blood or other fluid loss makes the heart unable to pump enough blood to the body, occurs and can cause many organs to stop working. Usually temporarily, but in extreme enough cases, sometimes permanently. A 2008 article posted to Slate.com reminds us, in 2004, a 14-year-old Iranian boy was killed while serving a sentence of 85 lashes. The person in charge of the punishment misfired, striking his head rather than his back causing a brain hemorrhage. A metal cable was used for the lashing in that case. With the head and cervical spine exposed, a single misfire, which is no doubt in the running for the greatest euphemism of all time, can have deadly consequences. Enough. This is no answer. While the front of the body is shielded somewhat by the body's proximity to the whipping post, I can imagine a whipping device catching the side of the face or the corner of the eye. Damn, we're off to a horrifying start. Maybe if we go back a little further. Ancient Greece, approximately 570 BC, a metal bull statue, ominously emitting a bellowing sound and snorting steam. Burn the bull! They're in the bull, he said. <laughs> Hence the small door on the side, but I'm sure you already know what's happening here. The brazen bull was invented by Perilus of Athens for his king Phalaris, an interactive sculpture with a hollow chamber on the inside where criminals would be forcefully detained. Uh, and then the fire is lit. Now, compared to other metals, bronze is a fairly poor conductor of heat. And as such, it may have been chosen intentionally to prolong the torture process by heating up more slowly. It was made so that when the man was howling in agony, his shrieks would emanate through specially distorted pipes. And of course, the harder the prisoner screamed, the more noise the bull made, and the more sadistic onlookers were entertained. It must have sounded something like this. Versus... <laughs> sounds about right. As they suffered, the first thing the prisoner must contend with is... Suffocation. Let's say you're buried alive in a coffin. 
An article on PopSci.com tells us, the average volume of a human body is 66 liters. That leaves 820 liters of air, one fifth of which, 164 liters, is oxygen. If a trapped person consumes 0.5 liters of oxygen per minute, it would take almost five and a half hours before all of the oxygen in the coffin was consumed. Obviously, this is not a direct analog. Maybe there's slightly less or more space inside the bowl. But this example tells us that the oxygen content within the bowl would likely be enough to sustain a human being for several hours. Also, because of the instrumental pipes, and the possibility of an imperfect seal at the trap door, there are multiple places where the prisoner may draw more oxygen. This situation is unlike a burning room where flame consumes and thus minimizes oxygen content in the air. The metal body of the bull separates the oxygen within from the flame outside. Unfortunately, suffocation due to lack of oxygen in the air is not the only issue here. As the metal heats up, so will the air inside the bowl, which could cause inhalation injury, a term that refers to damage to the respiratory tract or lung tissue from heat, smoke, or chemical irritants. Obviously, in this case, we're talking about heat. And in most cases, a thermal injury is confined to the upper airways because the trachea usually shields the lung from thermal loads. True lung burn occurs only if you directly breathe in a hot air or flame source or have high pressure force the heat into you. In this case, I actually think it likely. As damage accumulates in the tissues of the respiratory tract, they will become inflamed, effectively closing it bit by bit and it will become harder to breathe. Now, let's address the most obvious problem. I came across this YouTube comment by Graham Black during my research, who reminds us, the victim would be constantly moving, as any part of the body couldn't be in contact with the metal for any length of time. You would go into blind panic and start thrashing around. The National Institute of Health tells us a temperature of 52 degrees Celsius or 125 degrees Fahrenheit can cause a full thickness skin burn in two minutes and a temperature of 54 degrees Celsius or 130 degrees Fahrenheit can cause a full thickness burn in only 30 seconds. A full thickness burn is one that extends through and destroys all layers of the dermis and often injures the underlying subcutaneous tissue. According to the typical burn classification chart, these are burns in the third and fourth degree. Let's have a look. As the burn worsens, the skin progressively blisters and blackens, progressively destroying layer upon layer of skin cells. As I've already mentioned, burn severity depends both on the heat the skin is exposed to and the duration for which it is exposed, lending weight to Graham Black's previous comment, especially in the initial heating phase of the bull. The prisoner would shift their weight frantically, which unfortunately would cause them to sweat and contribute to overall dehydration. Now, you might think that as things heat up, flesh might light on fire, but that isn't the case, at least not for a very long time. And the victim would definitely be unconscious before then. Although the skin can burn, it is fairly flame resistant with a flash point of 1600 degrees. That is to say the lowest temperature required for ignition. I can't explain the pain because I'm screwing. Kill my nerves, please, kill them! Also, the human body is largely made up of water, roughly 60%, which would offset any tissue combustion response until the water was evaporated. First, burns would accumulate on the skin, causing it to crack, blister, and shrink, eventually exposing the muscle and connective tissue underneath. You'd just be slow roasting like Swiss chalet chicken, but without the rotisserie. Fairly quickly, the frantic struggle would cease and the victim would collapse in the bull, exposing some portion of their torso to the heated bronze. At this point, the transmission of heat from the bull to body accelerates due to the increased surface area and the internal organs begin to rapidly overheat, leading to damage and failure. This process known as hyperthermia can cause proteins in the body to denature. That is to say that the excess heat causes the bonds that hold the protein structures to break and the proteins unravel, leading to cell death and organ failure. This is very bad news because enzymes, which are the proteins that catalyze or facilitate chemical reactions in the body, if they denature, these reactions may no longer occur. 
An excerpt from Cell 2nd edition explains, In the absence of enzymatic catalysis, most biochemical reactions are so slow that they would not occur under the mild conditions of temperature and pressure that are compatible with life. No chemical reactions in the body means no life, as the denatured proteins in this case would clump together and become increasingly toxic. Okay, pause. Let's take a breath. That's a lot of information to take in. And in reality, the combination of hypoxia, hyperthermia, dehydration, pain, panic, and exhaustion would render a person unconscious within only a few short minutes. This horrific form of public torture was usually reserved for serious crimes, enemies of the state, those who offended the gods, but in a terrible twist of fate, the creator of the brazen bull, Perilous, was forced to test his own invention after creating it, being partially cooked alive, only to be pulled out before he could die. This type of mercy would be a rare occurrence, but on the off chance a victim was removed from the bull while still alive, they would require some intense TLC. I hope a skilled physician was nearby. Doctors looked at me, they were like, you need emergency surgery! Depending on how badly they'd been burned, treatment can be quite extensive, involving debridement or removal of dead tissue, skin grafts, or the use of synthetic skin. What family do you think is going to be happy to learn that their loved one's skin got wasted on an asshole who set himself on fire on purpose? Quite often, burn victims require intravenous or IV antibiotics to prevent infection and IV fluids to replace fluids lost when the skin was burned. In ancient Greece, however, this translates roughly to bed rest and hope for the best. There is, however, evidence of a tracheostomy being performed in ancient Greece. Long before the dawn of modern scientific medicine, the operation of tracheostomy was known and performed. Mention of the operation is first found in the writings of two Greek physicians, Galen, 2nd century, who credited Asclepides with being the originator of the operation, and Aratius, 2nd century. So at least there is a chance that an obstructed airway due to burn damage or heat inhalation could be addressed. Unfortunately for Perilous, although Phalaris spared him death by his own creation, legend has it he immediately had him escorted over to a cliff where he was then thrown off. But wait a minute, I wasn't done talking about fire. Okay, hold up. I honestly can't decide what's worse. Here we are faced with yet another form of torture that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. But again, that has been used far too many times throughout history in many different forms. The souls of others to hell's fire, spreading his false religion. I cannot imagine what's going through this man's mind right now. A lot of what we've covered in relation to the brazen bull holds true here, but the direct exposure to the flame still changes things a fair amount. Without a minimally conductive metal acting as an intermediary, body tissue dehydrates, burns, cracks, and tightens much more quickly. Heated to an unsustainable degree, muscles shrink and contract tightly, which may cause joints to flex and the body to adopt the pugilistic stance or boxer-like body posture of flexed elbows and knees and clenched fists. Some victims of the unexpected Mount Vesuvius volcano eruption at Pompeii in 79 AD have been immortalized in this horrific pose, their bodies covered and encased in lava. This chilling diagram depicts the sequence of skeletal affliction by fire in pugilistic posture, adapted from Symes et al. By examining the first places where the bone was burned, we can infer where the outermost tissues suffered the most damage early in the process. The bottoms of the feet, the elbows, the knees, hands, hips, shoulders, front of the rib cage, cheeks, etc. Or in other words, not the most vital organs. Fire works its way from the outside towards the interior. We are come to witness the burning of these Protestant heretics. Obviously, as pictured here in the film Elizabeth, more than one person might be burned at the stake together. I'm trying my very best to focus on the anatomy here, but damn. <sighs> what this means is pain, extreme pain. 
This would be greatest at the beginning of the burning process as the fire builds around the victim or victims. Fourth degree burns that go through both layers of the skin and underlying tissue as well as deeper tissue, muscle and bone, do not have feeling as the nerve endings are destroyed in this process. Kill my nerves, please! Unfortunately, there are innumerable nerve endings in the body at various depth and in association with different tissues and structures, offering many new nerves for the fire to caress once the previous layer has been destroyed. Thankfully, however, it doesn't work like that. A delimiter is an instrument used to measure pain threshold in humans, and a dole is its unit of measurement. This scale extends from one to 10, where one represents the least perceptible stimulus and 10 represents the point where an increase in stimulation causes no further increase in sensation. By some estimates, 11 dole, pain was effectively off the charts, somewhere between childbirth and taking a blowtorch to the face, is the maximum amount a person can tolerate before entering a state of shock. Yo, yo, stop, turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> the body need only reach this threshold one time before the central nervous system triggers the release of a flood of chemicals referred to as stress-induced analgesia. A 2008 study in progress in neurobiology tells us, pharmacological and neurochemical studies have demonstrated involvement of a large number of neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. In particular, there are key roles for the endogenous opioid monoamine, cannabinoid, and gamma aminobutyric acid and glutamate systems. That's a freaky mouthful. The body would be overwhelmed with pain very quickly, initiating this acute pain suppression response. You would lose consciousness within the minute due to hyperthermia or hypoxia, doled out by the fire in one of many horrifying ways. Autopsies of burn victim fatalities may show evidence of strangulation by shrunken skin around the neck and airway, evidence of heat hematomas, a pool of mostly clotted blood, in this case clotted by heat, that forms in an organ, tissue, or body space, and suffocation via edema, or swelling caused by too much fluid trapped in the body's tissues due to hot air and smoke in the respiratory tract. C.R. Fosterling, a longtime firefighter over on Quora, attempted to answer the following question from firsthand experience. Sadly, I've witnessed this in real life. From that perspective, my answer to how long someone would suffer if engulfed in flame is too damn long. I'd hope the initial sensation of pain is diminished or even blocked completely, and the response I witnessed was due more to panic and not so much pain. It may seem silly to someone that I would say that, but I find just a little bit of consolation in there being less pain involved for the victim. On this fateful day, he and his team arrived at the scene of the crash just a little too late. The driver that I spoke of earlier in this answer went from having no fire in the vehicle as I pulled up to the scene to being completely engulfed in flames in just less than a minute. Her fuel tank was ruptured in the collision and the fuel was ignited in a pool under and throughout her car. As we tried everything we could to save her, we were pushed back by the intense heat and flames. At the time, it felt as if she was screaming hysterically and struggling for a long time. Every second felt like 10 minutes. The reality is that she was unconscious within the minute after being fully engulfed in flames. It seems that time likes to crawl in those minutes that you feel completely helpless. It's a cruel illusion. How a human could subject another human to a fate such as this is beyond me. My heart goes out to this woman and anyone who has suffered a similar fate. Okay, so on that note, that is a sufficient dose of torture for today. We'll explore the statistic side of human history a little more some other time. For now, remember to follow my online gym, Human 2.0, for free right here on YouTube, where we help you move better and prevent injury. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if you wanna be one of those few people that dislike it, I can't understand why. Be sure to explain yourself in the comment section down below. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.